Well, folks, it's finally here. I'm super excited to finally get to share with you this, my most requested video of all time. In this massive, comprehensive, movie-length documentary, I intend to cover every single iteration of the popular Ultraman Kaiju Red King to ever appear on screen. Spoiler alert, there's tons of them. In detail, looking both at their behind-the-scenes origins and in-universe history. And not only that, we're also going to get into Red King's minor appearances in manga, video games, etc. Discuss Red King merchandise, rank the top three best Red King iterations as well as determine the worst, dissect the monster's relationship with the Kaiju Gamora. I mean, I've got so much content for you all today that you may even feel like doing something as wacky as subscribing to this channel by the end. So, without further ado, I, the Toku Professor, present The Complete History of Red King. Let's dive in. <laughs> Beginning such a massive lecture is a daunting task, but perhaps the best way to start is to tackle the topic of the kaiju's name, and answer the question, why is this yellowish monster called Red King? It all goes back to the mid-60s, during the early planning stages of the second Ultra series. Back then, the show and development which would become Ultraman had a different name, as did the titular hero. The original title of the show was Bimular Scientific Investigation Agency, but as the production developed, the name was changed to the one we all know and love today. Red Man. Uh, wait, Red Man? That's right, being a mostly red hero, the main character of the series was given the name Red Man until it was switched one more time to Ultraman prior to the show's registration. Tsuburaya Productions would later use the former name as the title of a super low budget 1972 production about a violent hero named Red Man fighting floppy Ultraman monsters in the wilderness. But thankfully, we won't be needing to look at that show today because somehow Red King was able to avoid the curse of Red Man and didn't appear in that show. But the name Red Man is very important in deciphering where Red King's name comes from. See, back before the Ultraman series was given its finalized name, a monster named Red King was apparently going to be the king of the monsters in the show, appropriately named similarly to his heroic rival after the color red. Aha, we've pinpointed the creature's origin. Well, at least his name anyway. The monster's actual appearance still had to be worked out at this point. Tetsuo Kenjo, who along with Shozo Yuhara wrote the script for an episode we'll be checking out soon, The Lawless Monster Zone, stated he actually imagined the creature as being a Red King Kong as he was writing. But monster designer Tol Narita had other ideas. He drew Red King like this, with an almost snake-like face, a silver coloration, and ridges all over his body, apparently to make him look gigantic. And this design was carried over to the costume. Ryosaku Takayama, depicted here alongside the kaiju suit, was the one who modeled it and he followed Narita's design closely, even the creature's silver color. It was apparently on set that the monster finally received the yellowish color he is now known for. The staff decided to spray paint the silver monster blue, and then added in ochre color and a little silver on top of that. And voila, Red King had his true shade at last. Throughout this colorful journey, the monster seems to have been made every color but red. Nevertheless, Red King he remained. For what was kind of Red King's debut episode, more on that in a moment, Teruo Aragaki, who had previously played Bimular, Antlar, and Gasura, was enlisted to wear the costume. Once he'd played the part and the filming was complete, all Red King needed was a roar. And man, they nailed it in this department, creating one of the most iconic monster cries of all time. <laughs> <laughs> by combining noises produced by Toho's Godzilla and Gaira. I find it appropriate that the kaiju goes around yelling that he wants to SPAR all the time, since sparring really is his thing. As I alluded to a minute ago, episode 8 of Ultraman, The Lawless Monster Zone, was only kind of Red King's debut. If you've watched my History of Chandler video, you may know where I'm going with this. To promote the Ultraman series and introduce the show's characters, and most likely also to give the show's staff time to catch up on completing several episodes since they were behind schedule, Tsuburaya Productions decided to put on a live performance featuring the show's cast and air it on TV the week before the true first episode of Ultraman. Referred to as The Birth of Ultraman, this production gave audiences a sneak peek at several of the kaiju they could expect to see in the weeks ahead. At that point, Red King was one of the few kaiju who had been made totally from scratch for the new series, so it made sense that he was one of the monsters that Tsuburaya Productions wanted to show off in this promotional show. And so, the birth of Ultraman became the birth of Red King as well. Let's dive into this production and look at it from an in-universe perspective, shall we? 
After a trio of bumbling monster thieves accidentally provoked several Ultra Q monsters into attacking, a group of singers working for a man claiming to be the special effects wizard Eiji Tsuburaya himself informed the Master of Monsters that a group of kaiju from the new Ultraman series were now also on the loose. Sure enough, several never-before-seen creatures soon appeared on the stage, with Red King taking the lead. The monster carefully descended the stairs so as not to trip, and led the Ultraman monsters into an all-out brawl with the Ultra Q kaiju. A very gentle all-out brawl. Well, okay, it did get a little violent when Red King backed up into this T-Rex skeleton prop. <laughs> At Kanagon's insistence, Red King temporarily called off the fight to let the performers sing the theme of the SSSP as they arrived on stage, but once the song was over it was right back to business as usual, except now Red King had science patrol members he could spar with too. Despite the incredibly small stature of these monsters, the SSSP still weren't able to get things under control, so it was up to Ultraman to save the day by beating up Kanagon and knocking Garamon's head off. Red King and Chandlar were the only two conscious kaiju left when the telecast cut away to clips of Ultraman battling Naranga, but we can assume that the hero was probably able to beat them into submission and return them to captivity off screen. However, Red King would later get let out again by the man who said he was Eiji Tsuburaya when he tried to prove he was who he said he was, but instead he just ended up proving to everyone that he was a fraud because Red King and the other monsters wouldn't listen to him. Luckily, the real Eiji Tsuburaya was in the audience, and he was able to get all the kaiju to quiet down, since he was the creator of the series after all. He even agreed to lend the repentant monster thieves a kaiju of their own, and tried to give them Red King, but he was a little too intimidating for their taste, so Garamon was chosen instead. The special ended with all the cast, Red King included, jamming out to the Ultraman main theme. And that was Red King's first on-screen appearance. What do you say we move right on to the second and look at some actual canonical action now? Let's do that. Red King was one of many monsters awakened following a volcanic eruption on the Pacific island of Tatara, and battled for supremacy against the other kaiju in brutal sparring matches. Chandlar was his first on-screen opponent, or should I say first on-screen victim, because Red King went completely and totally all out in this fight. Oh no! This fight! Ah yes, time to watch the master of his craft at work. I'm taking notes, could come in handy for boxing club. Red King charged at Chandlar, but was immediately knocked to the ground when Chandlar flapped his wings and created a powerful gust of wind. The winged kaiju moved in for an attack, which Red King countered. Then, the yellow monster chucked a boulder at his foe's chest and began to grapple him. Chandlar was able to break free for a moment, but soon Red King took hold of him again, so Chandlar took it to the next level and bit Red King in the arm. Enraged, Red King ripped one of Chandlar's wings off. Hmm, I somehow don't think the boxing regulations will allow me to do that. The kaiju picked up the severed wing triumphantly and tossed it back at Chandlar, and chased the poor monster away by flinging more boulders at him. But almost immediately, a new challenger surfaced, the burrowing monster Magular, who took one look at Red King and instantly ducked back underground. So that didn't last long. It was at this moment that the Science Patrol, on a mission to Tatara Island to try and rescue four men who had lost communication with Japan, flew right past Red King as he roared menacingly. Several members were tempted to engage the kaiju, but chose to leave it alone for the time being and focus on the rescue mission. Having been established as an incredibly brutal monster, Red King spent most of the rest of the episode off screen as a looming threat, until after the SSSP located the only survivor on the island, who a pigmon had been caring for. Red King suddenly smashed through a pile of nearby boulders, probably looking for the next victim to beat up, and in a noble but nonetheless foolish act, the little kaiju pigmon rushed off to confront Red King, in order to protect the man he'd been looking after. Luckily though, he wasn't alone on the front lines. The SSSP leapt into the fray to drive the big bully monster away, but their weapons only mildly annoyed Red King, and instead of leaving, Red King began hurling rocks again, and poor pigmon was killed by several of these stones. As the little creature's life faded away, the balloon bomb the SSSP had attached to him earlier when they were following the little monster through the jungle drifted toward Red King's face. Arashi and Ide fired at the balloon and blew it up in Red King's face, causing the bully to drop a gigantic boulder on his foot. This made Red King absolutely furious, and he started chucking boulders as fast as he possibly could, and waved his arms as if to say, Come out and fight me like a kaiju, you cowards! Well, he'd get the match he wanted, but little did he know his next opponent would be on a completely different level of strong than any of his past challengers. Ultraman soared in and kicked Red King in the back, catching the monster off guard, and causing him to perform an angry face rub. In retaliation, he tried to ram Ultraman, but missed and fell over again, to his utter annoyance. He lifted a rock to hurl it at Ultraman, but the hero hit the rock with his spacium ray, causing Red King to drop the rock on his foot again, adding further insult to injury. 
Then Ultraman lifted the furious kaiju off of his feet by his neck and hurled him into a rock pile. One more toss and Red King was done. Ultraman had finally given the brutal Red King a taste of his own medicine. Surprisingly easily too. Before we move on, I'd like to analyze this first canonical appearance for Red King a little more, since it laid the groundwork for all the fun times we'd have with the kaiju in preceding years. It was here that Red King got nearly all of his character traits that make him such a loved kaiju. In this appearance he is depicted as a brutal monster that desires to destroy everything that moves, can rip other monsters to pieces with his insane strength, and lives to fight, but at the same time also as a stupid stooge who perfectly encapsulates the stereotype of an all brawn, no brains character, and is constantly getting whacked and slammed around, adding fuel to his fire of fury. This is comedic gold and we the audience can't get enough of it. He kind of has a lot in common with Donald Duck, another character prone to explosive temper tantrums and constantly having disastrous things happen to him. But in Red King's case, we don't feel bad for him at all when his idiocy gets him beat up, because he's a bully that rips the appendages off of other kaiju and totally deserves it. The Lawless Monster Zone is also the origin point of Red King's rivalries with both Chandlar and Pigmon. We'll be seeing both of those dynamics again a bit later on. Tsuburaya Productions must have realized they struck gold with Red King, because they brought him back for another episode that aired just four months after the Lawless Monster Zone. On we go to Mystery Comet Suifon! Well, in just a second, anyway. High quality monster suits are apparently very expensive to produce, and so for the original Ultraman series, Tsuburaya Productions would often reuse costumes they already had and modify them into new kaiju to cut costs. And that was the fate of the Red King costume. It got painted blue and given a completely different head and became the suit for the kaiju Abaros, the rival of Banira, for episode 19 of the show. You might think this would ruin Red King's chances of returning, since he, well, wasn't Red King anymore. But thankfully it turns out that the changes made weren't serious enough that the suit couldn't be reverted back. So, after Gorgos from Ultra Q was, for some reason, removed from the monster lineup of episode 25 of Ultraman, and an opening came up, Tsuburaya Productions decided to go ahead and do the work necessary to bring Red King back. The costume was repainted yet again from blue back to yellow, except it was actually a bit more gold this time around. For whatever reason, they also decided to construct Red King a distinct new head, perhaps because they'd lit the first one on fire. Several lumps of clay were applied to the neck to represent the bombs he swallows in the episode. But, wait a second, why are they in his neck and not his stomach? Is Red King choking? Oh no, does anyone know how to do the Heimlich maneuver on a monster? I is anyone actually tall enough? Well, thankfully he seems alright, but we should definitely keep an eye on that. For Red King's second appearance, a new suit actor was chosen to play the kaiju, namely Kunio Suzuki, who also wore the Gamora costume, and many others. As mentioned a second ago, the episode was called Mystery Comet Suifan, and was written by Bunzo Wakatsuki. Let's check the episode out. No joke, Red King's stupidity almost destroyed the world this time around. A kaiju was rumored to have attacked a ship carrying six hydrogen bombs in the sea of... Uh, um whatever that says, off the coast of Russia, and then disappeared somewhere in the Japanese Alps. This became an extremely pressing topic as the time for the Red Comet Suifon to pass the Earth drew closer and closer, because this comet was emitting cosmic rays that threatened to cause hydrogen bombs around the world to detonate unless measures were taken. And let's face it, it's awfully hard to take measures on a bomb when it's inside a monster and no one knows where it is. The SSSP flew over the mountains searching for the kaiju, knowing that if the bombs went off, the radiation would result in a huge amount of destruction, but time quickly began to run out. Then, before they could find the creature, the comet passed! And thankfully, nothing happened. Turns out the monster they were looking for, a Red King, possibly the son of the first one, was sleeping deep underground, and the cosmic rays didn't reach the bombs it had swallowed. But that didn't mean the bombs couldn't still go off, so the Science Patrol continued to search for the kaiju culprit and they didn't need to look for long. Red King was drawn to the surface and burst out of a cliff shortly after the comet passed, and I like to think that it was because he heard the sound of the two monsters Gigas and Duraco fighting nearby, because there's nothing Red King likes better than a good old fight to the death. Even if that wasn't the reason, it didn't take long at all for Red King to join the fight. But before he did, this classic scene was shown. Red King nodded, then cracked his knuckles, pumped himself up, and roared, ready to clobber his opponents. Absolutely awesome content. Gotta love Red King's human-like actions. The kaiju decided to take on Gigas first, and Dorako helped make the decision final by shoving him from behind. So Red King slammed Gigas to the ground, and after rubbing his neck, he whacked the white monster in the head. But then he decided to lunge at Dorako, who leapt out of his reach, resulting in Red King falling over. 
but he was quickly back on his feet, and this time Duraco couldn't escape. <laughs> Uh-oh. I think the suit is showing signs of having been used too much. Well, we're in-universe right now, so let's try to ignore it, shall we? Excellent. Moving on. Just as he'd done with Chandlar, Red King brutally ripped one of Duraco's wings off, but then he took it a step further and removed the other one too, opening and closing it triumphantly. Satisfied for the moment, he decided to watch Gigas and Duraco battle it out for a minute, and sat on a rock cheering for Gigas to finish the job, and his actions were so hilariously human-like. Man, isn't Red King an awesome kaiju? When Duraco knocked Gigas to the ground, Red King became visibly frustrated, rubbing his neck violently and his actions clearly indicated what he would have said if he could speak. I guess I'll have to handle this myself. And he re-engaged Duraco and soon had him in a... tail lock, I guess. Then, he and Gigas attempted to squish Duraco between their powerful bodies, but they ended up tackling each other, and Red King's rage was once again directed at Gigas. The snow monster was mercilessly attacked and fled for his life. Meanwhile, the SSSP had finally positioned themselves to strike the monsters, and Red King was hit with a blast from behind by Shin Hayata, the man who could transform into Ultraman. Red King didn't like this, so <laughs> he used a big punch to turn Hayata into a doll. Luckily, the SSSP member didn't lose his beta capsule and transformed into Ultraman. It was rematch time. Ultraman didn't have access to his Spacium Ray this time around, because if he used it, that would likely cause the bombs Red King had swallowed to blow up, but he wouldn't end up needing it. Red King did put up a much better fight against the hero this time around, and was even able to hurt the Ultra's neck with a strong squeeze, and beat him up while he was down, but in the end, he was still very much outmatched, and got thrown around a lot during the fight. Then, to wrap it all up, Ultraman used this really unique move to lift the monster in the air, and then cut the monster to pieces with several circle-shaped energy blasts that I like to call Cheerios, because I always have, and it's funny. Turns out Red King isn't the only violent one around here. Ultraman took the kaiju's head to space, where the bombs the creature had swallowed could blow up harmlessly, and the Earth was finally safe. Moral of the story, don't eat bombs, kids. With two excellent canonical performances under his belt, Red King's career was off to a great start, and the original Ultraman show's run wasn't even over yet. And you know what's crazy? He was almost able to squeeze a third appearance into this one show. Episode 38, The Little Hero, called for Red King to reappear, apparently alongside the kaiju Gamora, and battle this other violent monster, after both were revived by the powerful Geronimon. That's right, this would have been the beginning of the Red King and Gamora rivalry, which we'll see quite a bit of later on. However, it was not to be. As is apparent upon watching some of the scenes from Mystery Comet Suifon, the Red King suit was starting to fall apart from overuse, and Tsuburai Productions deemed it too damaged to use again. Gamora was given the same verdict, and so they were replaced with Telestan and Duraco, whose suits were in better shape. What's hilarious is that if Red King hadn't had this role taken from him, he may have gotten to take out Pigmon again. <laughs> oh, sorry, Kashima-kun. <clears throat> anyway, interestingly, the English dub of Ultraman never got the memo that the monsters got switched out, because in this episode, they still mention Red King. Gamora and Red King! Even though, that's not who it was. Aside from this mention, Red King missed out on getting to appear in this episode, but his agents must have been hard at work, because hardly any time passed before Red King was given another opportunity to return. As the Ultraman series finally came to a close, Tsuburaya Productions was planning their next show, namely Ultra 7. If you've seen the show, you know that Ultra 7 doesn't just battle monsters, he happens to have several of his own, called Capsule Monsters, which actually served as an inspiration for Pokemon. All of these kaiju are totally new creatures, but that wasn't always going to be the case. At one point, Seven's capsule monsters would have been recurring monsters, namely Pegila, Pagos, Antlar, and, you guessed it, Red King. The brutal corn on the cob monster could have appeared as soon as Episode 3, and would have battled Ella King instead of Miklas. But for better or for worse, Red King's chance was once again squandered, because for unknown reasons, he and all the other capsule monsters got replaced. And then, he was apparently considered to appear again in the show as a villainous monster, in an unreleased episode called Alien 15 plus Monster 35. And yet again, he missed out. He was even considered to be an invading kaiju in Ultraman Taro, but was discarded because he wasn't intelligent enough to invade Earth. So sad. Still, I assume these near inclusions are a testament to his high popularity at the time. Black King, from Return of Ultraman, may have been inspired by the yellow kaiju. But yeah, otherwise, things sort of fell apart for Red King for a while, and he got banned to the realm of minor appearances and cameos, which is certainly a better place than many other monsters find themselves, but it's a little underwhelming when you consider Red King's stellar rookie season. 
We'll have a whole section of this video dedicated to minor appearances later on, near the end of the video. So for now, let's jump to when Red King was finally able to fully jump back into the action. Red King went from appearing in Ultraman to showing up in THE Ultraman. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about! Anime! As much as it pains me as a tokusatsu professor, we unfortunately do have a little bit of anime to cover today. Because this is, after all, the complete history of Red King. So we will go wherever the subject takes us. At least it's an anime about a toku franchise. Any other kind is frowned upon in the society I live in. Red King was initially supposed to appear in episode 1 of the The Ultraman series, alongside three others of his kind, but they were all replaced by the kaiju Sigra. Luckily, Red King finally returned in episode 27, which was written by Bunzo Wakatsuki. Now, let me see, who wore the Red King suit this time? Uh, oh right, it's an anime. There wasn't one. Fooey. Well, I guess it's on to the in-universe stuff then. This meteorite, known as Baradon, was under the control of the Baradon Seijin, a group of green aliens intent on the conquest of Earth. The Seijin race landed their meteorite in the ocean and let out a large group of returning monsters they'd gathered from the depths of space to wreak havoc on our home planet, but all of the kaiju just immediately began fighting among themselves to the aliens' dismay. They did have one trump card though, and because of an animation error, audiences of the show got to see him for a second before he was actually released. But then the alien Baradons actually did release their ultimate monster, and Red King got his true reveal. The science guard party shot a missile at the neck of this behemoth, but it was ineffective, and the enraged monster fired a weird purple substance at the two members in retaliation. A second blast destroyed a nearby Ghostron, inadvertently saving the science guard party who'd been surrounded. Not long afterward, a Gokine Zura tried to attack Red King from behind. That worked great. The King then caught sight of the Science Guard party again and nearly flattened two of their members, but help arrived just in the nick of time and the Kaiju had to focus his attention on taking out several ships that wanted him dead. Then he found the two men who'd escaped him before and one of his eyes glowed. For some reason, that happened multiple times in this episode. Maybe he needs to visit an optometrist. In typical Red King fashion, he tried to flatten the two Science Guard party members with rocks, and then knocked Hikari, aka Ultraman Jonius, into a pit where he'd set a bomb to go off earlier. Unfortunately for Red King, his aim wasn't accurate enough to finish off the trapped hero, and soon he was forced to pick on somebody his own size. The Ultra and Kaiju exchanged blows, and then several other monsters joined the fray, but Jonius took them out without any effort, and with the help of some skillful flight to dodge Red King's weird breath attack, he was able to land a strong blow, but the creature knocked him to the ground with his tail as he fell. Moments later, Red King leapt toward Jonius, hurling his entire body into the air, but Jonius had the perfect answer. The attack connected, and Red King was sliced in two and blew up in a massive, fiery explosion. Once more, Red King had been able to take out other kaiju with ease, but the Ultra was again too much for him. The last main series Ultraman show of the Showa era was Ultraman 80, and it fittingly gave a select few popular monsters one last chance to shine. Or two chances in the case of Alien Balton. Gamora and our friend Red King were the other two lucky creatures. Red King appeared in episode 46 of the show sporting a brand new look, with some aspects of both of the first two generations of Red King. This suit was constructed by Monsters Incorporated, a company belonging to Shinichi Wakasa, not to be confused with the Pixar movie. Tomohiro Sato wore this costume, and the script was written by Yasushi Hirano. Let's check out this next appearance. The method Tsuburaya Productions used to bring back Red King this time around was... interesting. They wished him back into existence, quite literally. Ah! Some kids discovered a magic jar in an icy cave while out on a skiing vacation, and it turns out that inside this magic jar was this magic genie guy who was willing to give the kids anything they wanted as long as they did some cleaning first. I guess something about living in a piece of pottery makes you very generous. Maybe a bit too generous, as we'll soon see. A group of three bullies wanted in on the getting whatever you want action, so they just stole the jar bully style and discussed what they should order amongst themselves. They decided on asking for a moving kaiju figure, and after considering getting one of Ella King or Wu, settled on a Red King toy. So they asked for one, but it appears that they may not have been clear enough with their instructions to the magic guy. It's pretty funny, the only reason Red King got to come back in this episode was because a kid wasn't clear enough about wanting a toy. This was Red King's first chance to wreak some havoc in a city, and the amazingly violent monster wasted no time in getting right to it. He got hit by some guaranteed to never defeat a kaiju blasts from the UGM's riser guns, which, surprise, didn't work, and then continued clobbering buildings, so the UGM instead fired some also guaranteed to never work blasts from their aircraft, and Red King responded by just knocking all their vessels out of the air. 
Okay, I think it's time to turn things over to Ultraman 80 now. After his transformation, 80 got right to work wrestling the tough monster, knocking him to the ground several times. This infuriated Red King to the point of bringing back the good old angry neck rub. Nice to see some continuity here. When the Showa era brought monsters back, they often ended up behaving pretty differently. See Riella King and Ultraman 80 Gamora, for example. But Red King seems like his old self. The momentum of the battle suddenly switched to favor Red King following this, and the kaiju began slamming 80 with hit after hit after hit, and even landed a powerful bite to 80's shoulder, which reminded me of the bite Red King himself received from Chandler back in Ultraman 1966. I see. A champion fighter should be willing to learn techniques from opponents. Very interesting. Oh, true. No, 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 no. Ow. Hey, Kishimu-kun. Just helping you learn that technique. Red King tossed 80 on the ground, and the hero's color timer began flashing. The Ultraman was determined to show the kids watching him the value of hard work, however, so he was quickly on his feet again, and again the tides turned, and he tossed his kaiju opponent around almost as if the monster's suit actor had left the costume. Oh, sorry, we're in universe. He then landed a super powerful moonsault kick on Red King, and followed it up with his beam, and wow, that was a fast turnaround. And just like that, the final major Red King of the Showa era was defeated. Man, the kaiju known for his power wasn't able to take down an ultra hero once so far. Will he fare any better in the Heisei era? Well, let's find out. At the start of the Heisei era, the Ultraman series doesn't seem to have been the prosperous IP it once was. The early 90s saw no new main series Ultraman shows being produced for Japanese audiences, and this of course meant Red King didn't get many chances to appear on screen during this decade. However, he wasn't entirely out of a job, because during this time Tsuburaya Productions put out two Ultra shows for audiences in other countries. The first, Ultraman Towards the Future, which released in Australia in 1990, didn't feature any returning monsters, so Red King didn't make it into that one, but the second, Ultraman the Ultimate Hero, was a perfect fit for our favorite corn on the cob kaiju, because it was basically a retelling of the story of the first Ultraman show for American audiences, and brought back many of the monsters from that show, Red King of course included. The King of the Color Red was back in business. And would you look at that, he's actually red this time! Well, at least the male one is. That's right, this show gave us both a traditionally colored female Red King, occasionally referred to as Red Queen, as well as a male variant that was true to the species name. According to an encyclopedia, Powered Red King, as this iteration of the creature is called, if they are male, may change color and become reddish in appearance during the mating season, which provides us a nice in-universe explanation for the creature's name. However, this design, as you can tell, doesn't just differ in color, Artist Mahiro Maeda gave both the male and female Red Kings a bit of an overhaul for this show, and modified their heads to resemble a skull, to reference the monster's title of The Skull Monster. One of Eiji Tsuburaya's grandsons, Hideaki, mentioned this new powerful design was created to appeal to Americans. Ultraman the Ultimate Hero had some of the highest quality suits in the Ultraman franchise, in my opinion. All of which were apparently modeled by Kevin Hudson, complete with cooling systems for the suit actors, listed here, and lots of nice details. Red Kings even had a gimmick that allowed its expression to be changed. Unfortunately, the costumes may have been a bit too well made, because the staff really wanted to protect them from getting damaged, and as a result, nearly all the action was drained from the fight scenes they were used in in this show. And sadly, this really lowered the quality of the monster footage in my opinion, including that of Red King. I think you'll notice this right away as we look at his and her in-universe history for this show. Powered Red King appeared in two different episodes of Ultraman the Ultimate Hero, with the first being Episode 3, written by Hiroshi Yamaguchi, which took place in the Guiana Highlands of South America. A heavily redesigned green bird-like Chandlar was minding its own business when suddenly a female Red King invaded its hunting grounds and appeared from around a corner. She immediately engaged her species' oldest rival, not being fooled for an instant by the Chandlar's new look. The monsters engaged in close quarters combat, and Red King was able to trip up its opponent with its tail. Chandler returned to its feet off screen and shoved Red King into a wall in retaliation. The episode then shifted focus away from the kaiju for a few scenes, and then we went back to following Chandler, and the Red King was no longer present. Had Chandler won the rematch? Uh, oh, nope, she's back. Looking for revenge, the Red King went back to using its tail, and after a few failed strikes with this weapon, one blow successfully tripped up its bird-like foe again, and it slammed into the side of a nearby cliff, and I guess got stuck there. Powered Red King then dealt these, uh, extremely powerful looking jabs, <laughs> 
to power Chandlar, and its foe countered by... Oh, wait. I guess Chandlar just sort of... died. We covered this fight back in my History of Chandlar video, and let's face it, even upon rewatching it, Chandlar dying here is still ridiculous. But since Red King is still alive, this time we get to see what happened next. Hopefully the quality gets better from here. With its opponent dead, Red King began trying to dig into the cliffside and attack a film crew trapped within a cave, but it was at this moment that the winner team arrived to rescue the crew. They lured the yellow kaiju away by firing some blasts, while Kinichi Kai led the stranded group to an area where they could be picked up and flown to safety. Unfortunately, Winner wasn't able to buy Kai enough time, and it began to meddle in his rescue operation. Kai tried to dissuade it with some little blasts, but Powered Red King shrugged these off easily and sent the young man flying with a strike from his tail. Luckily, he fell kind of slowly, which meant he had plenty of time to transform into Ultraman Powered before falling to his death. Powered engaged the Red King and gave the monster a taste of its own medicine by making it fall down. In response, the Red King began roaring in an unusual way, as if calling for someone. Because it was. Okay, here I come, honey. Hold on. The male-powered Red King came around the corner and smacked Ultraman Powered in the head, and checked to see if his wife was okay. The kaiju couple teamed up against Powered and surrounded him, battering the poor Ultra Hero with destructive gentle pats. As their attack continued, Powered's color timer began to flash. Luckily for the Ultra, Winner was able to hit the female with a blast that left her momentarily stunned, evening the odds. However, even just one Red King proved difficult for the hero to handle, and the male began trying to hurl Powered over a cliff. They battled near the precipice, and the Ultraman was thrown into a rock face. But then, something unexpected happened. I guess maybe the female was still dizzy from the strike or something, or perhaps she just misstepped, but suddenly she just plummeted over the enormous cliff and went rolling all the way down. Boy, this show. <laughs> At least the next few shots were done pretty well, though. This turn of events didn't leave the male very happy, and Ultraman Powered had to grab the morning monster to keep him from flinging himself after his wife. Understandably, the male didn't really feel like fighting anymore after this and began crawling around on the ground in deep distress and roaring while looking over the side of the cliff. Actually, a rather sad moment. At least the ultimate hero did something well. With the film crew now safe, Ultraman Powered saw no reason to continue the fight and left the kaiju to grieve his dead wife. Interesting how this show chose to portray Red King in a sympathetic light at the end rather than making him comedic like past shows. I personally enjoy Red King more as a silly bully and think Gamora works better in a tragic role, but I nevertheless think the ultimate hero handled this ending pretty well. Now, if only I could also say that about any of the kaiju scenes we saw prior to the male Red King being sad. Unfortunately, I definitely can't. It's pretty hilarious, though. So keeping your footing is everything in professional fighting. I'll make a note of that. Another Red Red King appeared in episode 12 of the series. Or I guess it could also be the same one, even though the location it appeared in was different. If it is the same, then man, that poor guy had a rough life. Kazunori Ito wrote the screenplay for this episode. After Powered Duraco emerged from a capsule that was sent by the Baltans, this male Red King confronted the heavily redesigned space monster, and we got to see yet another rematch between Red King and a previous opponent. This one didn't go nearly as well for our subject, however. Maybe it would have gone a little better for Red King if he hadn't just thrown himself on the ground to begin the match, but, uh, that's what he did. He then stumbled to his feet and moved in again, but Power Duraco suddenly whipped out a sharp, retractable claw, and, ooh, yep, I don't think Red King is recovering from that one. With this defeat, Red King lost his perfect record against kaiju opponents in major Ultraman shows that he had held since his very first appearance in Ultraman 1966, and it was against a monster he'd beaten up with ease in the past. Sorry, buddy, maybe just try to aim a little better when you charge next time around. Thus ends our look at Ultraman the Ultimate Hero. Definitely a cool kaiju design. I'd love to see it return in a show with today's special effects and monster action. You never know, Powered Data returned. Maybe we could see Powered Red King again someday. Kind of a hard costume to remake, though, I'm sure. Next up, we're gonna take it to the max. <laughs> The first few main series entries of the Heisei Ultraman series that rebooted the franchise didn't feature any returning monsters, but eventually familiar faces would start to show up again beginning around the time the Ultraman Max series came out in 2005, possibly to bring the Ultra series back to its roots after the failed Ultra N project. Red King was given a prominent role in Ultraman Max and appeared in three different episodes, as well as in a special exclusive to an Ultraman Max DVD. 
Every previous version of the monster we've looked at today adjusted the way the monster looked in at least some way, but this iteration went back to the original generation design from the Lawless Monster Zone. That being said, costume design had advanced considerably since the 60s, so this recreation looked much sleeker than the original, and was painted a very vibrant yellow. Red King has, for the most part, retained this Ultraman Max design right up until today, although the super bright colors seem to have been toned down a little in subsequent appearances. As far as I can tell, the exact same suit constructed for this show was still in use in last year's Ultraman Decker series. Kaimai Productions, founded by Eizo Kaimai, a modeler who worked on the original Godzilla costume, seemed to have crafted this modern Red King. Hiroshi Suenaga played the Max Red King in episodes 5 and 6 of the show, and Koichi Toshima, who continues to play different characters in the Ultra series, was the suit actor for Red King's return in episode 36. Apparently, an audition was held to see who was capable of playing Red King, and which potential suit actors had to walk up and down a hill while wearing a suit to see if they had the strength to play the powerful monster, and I guess these guys passed. Congrats, fellas! Red King was given a new ranged attack for this show, namely the ability to spew swallowed explosive rocks from his mouth. A technique devised by one of the directors who worked on an episode featuring the monster, Kenji Suzuki. Okay, I don't know about you, but I'm ready to get back in universe. One day, out in the Pacific, an island just suddenly appeared, instantly rendering charts of the region inaccurate. But worse crises than messed up maps would come from this development later on. The Dash team was sent to take a look at this unexplained landmass, which was codenamed Subject Phantom, and it was here that they would locate the terrifying monster from the original Ultraman series associated with the color red that we all know and love, who we've looked at today. Pigmon. Ha ha ha, you thought I was gonna say Red King. <laughs> Oh, but don't worry, Red King's almost here. Dash translated a tablet they found on the island, which talked about Pigmon coming to the land to subdue an evildoer who would rise again if Pigmon were to fall. Hmm, somehow I feel like that very thing might happen. Sure enough, an unfortunate sequence of events led to this Pigmon statue getting destroyed. The statue was sealing Red King underground, and as I've said before, seals only exist so that whatever is sealed inside can break out again at some point. See? In the episode following this one, Pigmon related to Kaido the story of how Red King was first sealed underground by an unknown alien race long ago. Red King looked so confused about what was happening, but now he was out again. Red King's initial goal upon being let loose was to destroy Pigmon again, but the Guardian Kaiju Salamadon wouldn't stand for it and rushed in to battle the Yellow Kaiju on Pigmon's behalf. Red King was too powerful for the amphibian though, and after knocking him around some, tried to kill Pigmon from a distance with his explosive rock spitting ability, but his aim was just a little off. Salamadon continued the battle and got a hit in from behind, but once Red King turned around he was able to get right back to routing the monster. He didn't even flinch when Salamadon fired tons of tail spikes at him. Said spikes just bounced off his yellow body harmlessly. Meanwhile, Dash prepared to attack Red King, but realized missiles weren't an option, because if they hit Red King with them, it would detonate the explosive rocks in his stomach. As they got into formation, the camera switched back to the kaiju battle, and revealed Salamadon had finally turned things around, and had Red King by the tail. This brief turnaround was short-lived, though. Red King broke free and Salamadon missed a lunge attack, and soon he was at the mercy of the brutal monster. The amphibian was narrowly able to buy himself a few more seconds of life, but Red King threw the kaiju on the ground, performed his signature face rub, and then pelted his opponent with explosive rocks. And that was too much for the underrated guardian monster to handle. Red King had won. It'd be up to Dash and Ultraman Max to take this big baddie to justice. Max got off to a great start and chucked Red King against a mountain. The Ultra was even able to completely dodge an incoming barrage of rocks Red King fired. Dash wasn't quite as lucky though, and their peril distracted Max, enabling Red King to get back into the fight. Both the hero and the monster traded powerful physical blows, and then another blast of exploding rocks from the kaiju was enough to cause Max's color timer to begin blinking. But this epic battle had a rather anticlimactic end, which was also admittedly amusing. Red King charged at Ultraman Max, but tripped in the trench he'd created by spitting up the explosive rocks, and fell and couldn't get up. All he could do was flail his arms harmlessly. It definitely pays to invest in your intelligence stat, because otherwise you'll have stuff like this done to you. Ow. All signs pointed to Red King having died from this attack by Max. Red King's tail even collapsed, which seemed like an indicator that that was that. But that somehow was not that. On to part two of the two-parter. Unbeknownst to anyone, Red King's tail suddenly began moving near the beginning of the next episode and disappeared under the ground. Soon afterward, Red King burst out, looking totally fine. 
Perhaps he sensed the kaiju Paragler who just showed up, and the prospect of getting to fight another monster kept him alive. I don't know. But he wasted no time and immediately began to battle the Varen-like second guardian monster of the island, overpowering him just as he'd done to the first. Paragler tried to slam into Red King by gliding, but was effortlessly thrown into the ground by his powerful opponent. As Paragler struggled to pull his head out, Red King did this funny braggy dance. What a lovable bully. Paragler roared and tried to charge into Red King on foot, but just ended up getting thrown on the ground again. Paragler made a little headway with some slaps to Red King's neck, but then tried to hit Red King with his tail. The yellow kaiju caught it and probably would have thrown Paragler again, but the purple creature did this spinning twist and broke free, and charged at Red King yet again. But he ended up getting kind of clotheslined and kicked in the jaw. Incredibly persistent, Paragler returned to the air and soared toward his mighty foe yet again, but this would be the monster's last charge. Red King chucked a boulder at his head and then spat more exploding rocks at the beast, and Red King had his second win of the series. It was around this point that Pigmon showed up to try and distract the victorious kaiju so that several Dash members could escape the island. Oh right, Subject Phantom was about to be blown up because it was drifting toward Japan and would have caused wide-scale damage if nothing was done. The explosive rocks inside Red King were cited as the main reason Japan was in danger from the island colliding with the mainland. But Red King had to have gotten those rocks from somewhere, right? Like, maybe from within the island itself? Just a detail that bugged me. Uh, anyway, back to Pigmon. I can't help but wonder if longtime Ultraman fans watching this for the first time kind of had a bad feeling as Pigmon approached the bully, considering Pigmon's past history of always getting killed. It really looked like that was going to play out again as Red King knocked the tiny monster over and lifted him off the ground, but Kaido was able to get Red King to release him and then transformed into Max for round number two against the Kaiju. Once again, the Ultra got things off to a brilliant start and landed several hits, while dodging every strike the monster tried to counter with. This infuriated the beast to the point of slapping himself again. With two minutes to go before Subject Phantom was annihilated, Red King tried to spit some more explosive rocks, but all he could let out was some dust. It seems what was left of the rock supply had become lodged in his body, and his smaller ammo had run out. Furious about this, he charged Max and missed again. Then he collapsed from stomach pain. Wow, Ultraman Max 100%ed that match. Red King didn't even get one hit in. Max took the kaiju up into space where he could explode without harming anything, and finished him off there. And once again, Red King's poor food choice got the better of him. You need to stop eating explosives, big guy. Red King's death didn't mean his exit from the Max series. The Skull Monster got an encore alongside Pigmon in Episode 36, Alternate Dimension World. An alien shamer, disguised as a genius scientist, pulled both monsters into our dimension again using a dimensional ray gun he created. This Red King was the same as the one before, pulled from the dimension Subject Phantom had disappeared into, and it still had the ability to fire explosive rocks. I like how confused Red King looks when he first shows up in the city. Red King immediately took out his ever-present rage on the buildings of the city, so Dash moved out right away, and Red King now had the opponent I'm sure he wanted. The kaiju was almost able to take out one of Dash's ships, but suddenly Red King disappeared back into the alternate dimension, and the vessel was just barely saved. But soon, thanks to Alien Shamer, he was back again and continued business as usual, so Dash returned to the battlefield, followed soon afterward by Ultraman Max. Round 3. Fight! This fight began with the common occurrence of a missed charging attack, but Red King was able to screech to a halt after this failed attempt as a cartoony sound played. There were quite a few of those in this silly fight. Explosive rocks and several really strong blows followed. Meanwhile, Alien Shamer prepared to go through with his plan to trap Ultraman Max in another dimension with the gun he invented, but Blast Number 1 missed both giant competitors, and their fight went on. Dash was able to handle Shamer, so he didn't get the chance to interfere in the brawl again. Next, we got an extremely silly Red King moment, when he tried to fly through the air like a superhero and punch Max. Epic fail. Max's expression after this maneuver is priceless. The fight continued and Red King was able to weaken his opponent considerably. Soon though, Max got his second wind and struck Red King with his Maxium Sword, drawing blood. This shocked and infuriated the monster to the point that perhaps he forgot to fight back. So Ultraman Max was able to finish him off for the second time, third if you count their first battle, and with that, Red King was at last eradicated from his show. Well, except he also appeared in an Ultraman Max DVD special. What is this? Have you ever seen one series give this much love to one kaiju? Well, I have, but wow, you have to admit this is a little crazy. This Red King was extremely vigorous and battled Max, apparently on Subject Phantom or in some tropical environment. 
as the two clashed for some reason a Zeton showed up out of nowhere to assist the Skull Monster. This should have been a monster victory. Their side was stacked. Plus, weirdly enough, Red King seemed like he was friends with this other monster for some reason. Highly unusual. However, this was just a short DVD special. Not really the right kind of episode for an Ultraman to lose. So, unsurprisingly, Max stepped up his game and took out both Kaiju, with Red King appropriately going down first. And with that, we can finally move on to the next Ultraman show, Ultraman Mabius. Red King appeared in two episodes of this series, playing a relatively minor role in the latter, and only showing up as a cameo in the former. Here he is floating in the monster graveyard in episode 21. With that one attended to, let's focus on his other performance in episode 42. The same suit actor who played Red King in his first two Ultraman Max episodes returned to play him in this show. What's more, the same suit was used since, well, they had it and it looked good. Let's check out this next appearance for the Yellow Beast. This Choju, named Gadiba, was a pet of the evil Yapul, who had the ability to take over and assimilate monsters. Monsters like, oh, I don't know, Red King, for example. Uh, hey, that was only an example! Okay, whatever, we'll roll with this. This Gadiba-controlled Red King began rampaging around on Tatara Island, the same island that was the setting for the old Lawless Monster Zone episode, and it wasn't long before the guys team became aware of it, and they moved out to fight it before it could reach inhabited territory. Red King fought back against their vessels with boulders, and not with a barrage of explosive rocks from his stomach like before. Turns out only the Max version of Red King had that ability. Nonetheless, this Red King was reportedly stronger than previous ones to appear in the Showa Ultraman universe. But he still had a weakness one of the previous iterations had that guys could exploit. Rather weak feet. Hitting him there didn't do all that much though, and the Kaiju retaliated by leaping super high up into the air. He threatened to smash into one of Guys' aircraft, so Ultraman Mabius arrived to put a stop to that. Red King tried to start things out by chucking a boulder, but Mabius just said, nah. So they instead just rushed toward each other and began a hands-on physical confrontation, which eventually resulted in Red King getting stuck in a rock pile and becoming extremely dizzy, allowing Mabius to finish him off. But his work wasn't done. With Red King defeated, Gadiba just proceeded to morph Red King into another kaiju he'd absorbed, Gamora. What happened next? Well, I have a whole video about the history of Gamora, so you can head over and watch it when this one is over to learn what occurred afterward. But for now, in this class, I just want to point out the fact that, hey, Red King and Gamora just finally got to be in the same episode. The clash that apparently almost occurred way back in the original Ultraman series had now actually come to be. Well, kinda. They didn't really, you know, get to interact with each other, did they? Oh, but they will. The Red King-Gamora rivalry was only just getting started, and it wouldn't be long before the two finally got to confront each other for the first time. Cue the Ultra Galaxy era. Tsuburaya Productions was in a difficult financial situation in the mid-2000s, and the Tsuburaya family ended up having to sell the company to the advertising company TYO, who eventually gave Bandai a huge chunk of the stake in the company. While all this was going on, the series continued, but not the same way it had been. The next two main series shows were quite different than anything released prior, and focused just on the monsters and not the Ultramen. The show Ultra Galaxy Mega Monster Battle was designed to be produced cheaply, using lots of monster costumes they already had in their warehouse, or wherever they were being stored. The Max Red King costume was apparently one of the ones they reused. The Yellow Monster appeared in Episodes 1, 7, and 11 of UGMMB, all of which were written by Kenichi Araki. He was played by Daisuke Terai in the first two, and Hiroshi Suenaga again in Episode 11. Lots to talk about, so let's get started. We'll begin with Episode 1, The Lawless Monster Planet. Hmm, that name reminds me of something. This episode marked the first time Red King got to fight Gamora, and that first brawl occurred under unusual circumstances, namely during the show's theme song. But even if that's not canon and doesn't count, well, it doesn't matter, the episode still gets the award anyway, as you'll soon see. But before that momentous occasion, Red King had some other kaiju to take on. Red King rushed out from somewhere when he heard the monsters Telestan and Sadola fighting on the surface of the planet Boris, desperate to do some fighting himself, as always. He rudely interrupted their match and just started crushing both of them. One of the Zap Spacey members watching the whole thing labeled Red King as the meanest monster of all, and the Yellow Kaiju definitely did his best to live up to that title in this fight, even squeezing poor Sadola to death. Yikes, sorry Kishimakun, forgot to warn you that was coming. Uh, it's okay, I'm fine. <laughs> what a powerful move, I'll make a note of that. 
After Sedola met his sad fate, Red King turned his attention to Zap Spacey, but then Telestan reappeared and basically saved them by distracting Red King. Maybe this guy is the true heroic monster of this show and not Gamora. Oh wait, this same Telestan was an antagonist in some of the following episodes. Hmm, maybe an anti-hero at least? Both Telestan and Red King survived this fight and were not seen together again, so somehow I guess the two decided to end the match. I'm sure Red King wasn't pleased with this treaty. Once again without a monster to fight, Red King decided to attack Zap Spacey's Pendragon, and was of course unfazed by their barrage of missiles. However, luckily for the team, they had another line of defense they weren't aware of. This guy. Or more specifically, this guy's personal Gamora. What Gamora, I hear you asking? The one on this card. No, no, no! Cards again! No! Get me off this thing! Uh, oh, that's better. At last, it was time for the two popular monsters to have the brawl they almost got all those years back. This fight really was worth the wait. The awesome kaiju action the UGMMB series would come to be known for was on full display in this great match. As this was the debut of Rey's Gamora, however, I think anyone watching could guess what the eventual outcome of this duel would be. Gamora 100% had his plot armor on here. I don't think Red King was informed of this though, because he really gave it his best effort. Realizing this foe was definitely on the tougher side, Red King looked around and, aha, here was something he could use to turn things around. Can we just play that again and enjoy Red King's little hand movements here? This monster is just so consistently entertaining and well played. Unfortunately, the King's boulder idea didn't work out, and before long he was overwhelmed by Gamora's new moves and exploded but this very Red King would end up getting a rematch later on. How is that possible? Let's skip to episode 7. It's kind of hard for the same Red King to have a rematch against Gamora while being dead, don't you think? Unless maybe he returned from when he was alive with the help of a kaiju who can distort time and space, like Bolton, for example. Wait, there's Bolton. And there's Red King. Guess it worked. Bolton also gave Red King some friends, namely the same old Telestan we looked at earlier, alongside Naranga. But here's what's interesting. Telestan and Naranga rushed right into battle while Red King just stood there and watched, not getting involved. Eventually, Zap Spacey and Ray's monsters began to take out these opponents, and still, Red King didn't join in. He held his ground and did nothing. It wasn't until all his allies were dead that Red King, the monster who seemingly wouldn't miss a fight for anything, finally joined the battle. And I think I have an idea as to why. Red King wanted to take on Gamora one-on-one, -on -one so he could beat him himself and redeem his name after being killed in their last match. He wanted revenge. But hey, that's just a theory. A toku theory! Anyway, Red King definitely looked like he had a chip on his shoulder at the beginning of this match. See? There it is. He slammed his tough foe as hard as he could and was able to toss Gamora to the ground. The exhausted Prince of the Monsters looked up helplessly as the King prepared to toss a boulder down on top of him. Had Red King won round two? Well, unfortunately, we'll never know because it turns out that he didn't actually have the one-on-one -on -one rematch he seems to have wanted. Gamora had an ally. Ray's Litra, in its fire form, suddenly soared down from above and smashed Red King's boulder with a fire strike. Then it fired at the surprise monster again, and this blast went down his throat. Yikes, that looks worse than eating a ghost pepper. Gamora could then easily end Red King's misery. Yeah, sorry about that, Red King. I think there was some illegal teaming going on in that brawl. Our kaiju of the day also showed up in episode 11 in a flashback, fighting an Earthtron. The results of that battle were never revealed. Okay, hope you've been enjoying these Ultra Galaxy battles, because now we get to cover another season of them, in Ultra Galaxy Mega Monster Battle Never Ending Odyssey, you see. On we go. Hey, he stole my toy! Uh, oh wait, that must be a different copy. Anyway, as with this show's predecessor, I could find very little behind-the-scenes info other than the fact that, once again, Hiroshi Suenaga played Red King in this show. So back in universe we go, with three more episodes to look at. The Red King featured in this show was owned by a Rayonix named Garande, an alien keel, and as episode 10 revealed, this iteration was a real powerhouse, able to beat up a powerful King Joe Black with ease, despite the robot being more powerful on paper. Red King was able to finish the mech off with a powerful kick. Now the question is, was he strong enough to finish the job the other Red King started and take out Ray's Gamora? The monster cracked his knuckles and leapt into action. Both kaiju seemed pretty evenly matched, but as time went on, Red King slowly began to whittle away at Gamora's strength. Then Red King surrounded himself by a burst of fire and began to really go to town, to the point that Gamora and Ray became dazed. Then, somehow, his arms became covered in flames, and he unleashed a bunch of extremely powerful fire punches on his newfound rival. What technique? 
What skill? What willpower to withstand the burn of scorched knuckles? I'll make a note of that. But what happened to Gamora? Well, Ray had one of those moments of being down but not out, and suddenly stood up by sheer force of the will and enabled Gamora to continue the fight. And instantly, the momentum shifted, and Gamora was in complete control, and began absolutely battering his yellow foe, to the point where Red King lay helpless on the ground, and Gamora prepared to finish things off. But Ray decided sparing him and his master might be a nice thing to do, so Gamora held back. And it's a good thing, because Ray and Gamora would end up needing Red King's help for the final battle against Armored Darkness. Turns out some people like having their lives spared, because Grande decided to return the favor and use his Red King to save Gamora's life during this fight. And now, for the first time, the Skull Monster and the Ancient Monster could fight for the same team. However, even their combined strength couldn't turn the tide of battle, and Armored Darkness seemed to have it in the bag. But then, the Pendragon provided some backup, which bought both Gamora and Red King enough time to transform into their EX forms! Wait, you didn't know Red King had an EX form? Well, he actually had one before this show came out, in the video game Ultraman Fighting Evolution Rebirth. But since I usually count games as minor appearances, and I typically cover those closer to the end of my videos, it would make sense if you didn't know about this version of the monster with gigantic arms. Yuji MMB Neo marked his first major appearance. The transformation would be pointless if it wasn't at least a little bit more powerful than normal Red King, and it appears that, yes, EX Red King was a step up. He and EX Gamora were able to handle their enemy no problem, and Red King was able to secure another victory. Just a little more to talk about for the Ultra Galaxy era. How about we look at a motion picture appearance for our pal? Red King was one of the dozens of monsters revived by Ultraman Belial in Ultra Galaxy Legends the movie, and upon being Mons loaded, immediately embraced Ray's Gamora. But it wasn't a happy hug. He ended up being easily taken down by Ultraman Zero after getting kicked a bunch of times. He was also one of the creatures that made up the massive monster Beludra's horns. One more major performance to go before the new generation era. Let's check out Ultra Zero Fight. With a name like that, you'd think there'd be zero fighting in this show. But we all know that can't be right, considering Red King is in it. In episode 1, written by Yoji Kobayashi, an alien bat revived a Red King, Bimstar, Ganku, and Galbaros to fight against Ultraman Zero in the monster graveyard. Here is the list of suit actors for this episode. I think we can assume one of them was playing Red King. Because Red King is an awesome monster, he got to fight Ultraman Zero first, and thanks to this Tector gear getting plopped on top of Zero, as well as being provided enough power to change into his EX form, he was able to completely turn things around compared to his last match against Zero. But an old nemesis would end up being the death of this Red King, that kaiju being Pigmon again. EX Red King and Alien Bat were distracted from Zero by this little guy, and seeing that the Garamond-like being was in danger, Zero was able to muster the willpower he needed to break free of his armor and blow EX Red King up. Man, have you noticed how many times Red King has exploded throughout his history? Let's see if he had an explosive new generation era. I don't know if you've noticed, but by this point in Red King's history, the creature was beginning to appear non-stop. It was starting to be unusual to have a series without him, and for the new generation era, that would definitely remain the case. His popularity was, and is, so high, he can barely ever get a year off. For this era, we'll start off with an Ultraman Ginga special, which unsurprisingly introduced a Red King Spark doll, which was first used by an alien Icarus to create a tyrant. I haven't mentioned this yet, since it's more of a minor appearances thing, but the Chimera Kaiju tyrant gets his legs from Red King, so this makes sense. Another special gave both Red King and EX Red King some time in the spotlight to mess around. In episode 8 of Ginga, Red King's Spark Doll got to be properly utilized, transforming one of Hikaru Raido's friends into the Skull Monster. And he even got a rise scene, like an Ultraman. Yoshihiro Rikimaru was the suit actor for this appearance. Because this Red King didn't have any control of itself, it ended up acting completely differently than you would expect the creature to behave, being scared to attack a Zoragus, and doing pretty terribly. Luckily, Hikaru, as Ultraman Ginga, arrived to lend a hand, but he would end up needing to finish off the enemy kaiju on his own, because Zoragus knocked Red King out of the match with his giant body spikes. The sequel series, Ultraman Ginga S, featured Red King twice in its EX form, once again as the result of a spark doll transformation. The monster was played by Kazunori Yoku, and the same suit from Never Ending Odyssey was apparently used again. Don't know if you noticed, but behind the scenes info for Red King's more recent appearances is pretty scarce. In my research, I couldn't find much, but if you know more, leave a comment. 
In Episode 1, the Android 1-0 became EX Red King to battle the underground monster Shepardon. The kaiju with the enormous arms was too powerful for the white creature and showed no mercy, sending Shepardon careening by creating a fiery eruption. This prompted Ultraman Victory to join the fray, followed soon afterward by Ginga, and EX Red King's fun was over. After this, Victory ended up using the creature's spark doll occasionally so the monster could lend him a hand. Literally. And then in Episode 8, when the power of Ultraman Ginga was unusable, Hikaru utilized the same spark doll to transform into EX Red King and battle the powerful Five King. Unfortunately for him, the King of the Number 5 proved to be much more powerful than the King of the Color Red. Did Red King make it into the next major series, Ultraman X? Who else were you expecting? <laughs> I think these constant Red King appearances are already driving me crazy. But we've come this far, I can fight through this just like Red King would. In the X series, the monster was played by Hiroyuki Arai in an episode written by Hisako Kurosawa, probably using the same suits from previous shows. Director Takanori Sujimoto apparently enjoyed giving the kaiju in his episodes new abilities, but refrained from doing so for Red King either because he felt like the monster shouldn't get any more or due to time constraints, or both. In this series, Red King once again came from a spark doll, but this time he was free to act on his own since he transformed into his true form as a result of a bunch of mysterious dark thunder energy and not because of anyone else. Upon appearing, he immediately went into destruction mode, Spaghetti. going straight for the buildings of the city he'd found himself in and ignoring the space cat creature floating next to him at first, until it tried to hug Ultraman X, who'd arrived to set things right. This odd sight completely confused the yellow creature for a moment. Red King soon got around to battering Ultraman X, as he is known to sometimes do to people, but why he thought he could use this thing to hurt the Ultra, I don't know. Not one of his brighter moments. The Space Cat wanted to help the Ultra, so Red King fought this round creature as well. When things began to not go the yellow monster's way, a blast of the Dark Thunder energy suddenly transformed him into EX Red King. The transformed beast looked tough for a second, but X just transformed into Exceed X, and moments later he could have said to the monster, You. Are. A. Toy. The Ultraman X series finale marked the last time EX Red King has ever appeared in live action, up to now anyway and the powered up monster's last moment was extremely brief. Alongside EX Gamora and Tsurugi Damaga, the kaiju was awakened by Grisa, and then absorbed into the powerful foe, with some help from the master hand. The spark doll monsters and cyber cards were eventually set free though, in an avalanche of toys, and assisted X in finishing off this menace. The Ultraman X film also got some slight representation of Red King, with the introduction of the Cyber Red King card. Red King finally got a bit of a break for the Orb and Jeed shows, but even these couldn't help at least doing something with the popular monster. He appeared on a Kaiju card in Orb, and a Red King capsule was used alongside a Gamora one in Jeed to create a new Kaiju that was a combination of the two beasts, Skull Gamora. Boy, the grouping of these two monsters as a duo suddenly became extremely common, huh? Since he's a combination of several Kaiju, we'll have to look at Skull Gamora another day. Ultraman Rube brought the monster back in person, and this show did something no other had done with the monster, as you will soon see. Hiroyuki Arai played the monster again for this show, in an episode written by Sachio Yanai and directed by Kiyotaka Taguchi, who seems to have called this iteration of the creature the most violent Red King in history. Ooh, this is gonna be great! Even though he seemingly didn't like anthropomorphizing the monsters he worked with too much, this director gave the Rube Red King attacks based on those utilized by his favorite wrestlers. Because he apparently felt this matched with Red King's original character, and I happen to agree with this stance. Let's see what this extra violent Red King is capable of. This violent version of the monster burst out of Mount Muho one morning and didn't have to wait long for a challenger, or rather two challengers, both Ultraman Rosso and Blue. Aw oh man, this is definitely gonna be quick. Red King's still never beaten an Ultraman, and now he has to face two. He landed some powerful hits, but then Rosso prepared to finish him off with a splash bomb, and Red King was once again def- Wait, what? He, he caught the beam! And he chucked it back as a counterattack! Ooh, yeah! I'll make 27 notes of that! Then he slammed the heroes in the stomach and smashed them into a mountain! Red King had done it! He'd beaten an Ultraman! No, two of them! That's my greatest hero! I'll make 50 gajillion notes of that! Oh, wait, I think I need a new notebook. Maybe don't write too many more, Pencil Leopard, because Red King didn't actually bother to finish the Ultraman off, and this would come back to bite him. Later on in the episode, we learn that the only reason the monster was in the area at all was due to Makoto Aizen, and he brought the monster back again while Katsumi was in the middle of a baseball game. 
To buy his brother some time, Isami rode off to confront the monster. We got this cool shot of him riding his bike with the kaiju in the background, and then round number two got underway. And boy, Red King could not have gotten off to a better start. Even when Rosso showed up to ruin everything, oh wait, Red King's the villain, uh, 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 I mean save the day, the monster still appeared to be way too much for the bros to handle. What do you do when you're being clobbered by a kaiju and can't seem to do anything to it? Well, you try a new toy, of course. Sorry, Red King, don't think you've got a shot at escaping an ad. Someday, I think it'd be awesome if an Ultra tried out a new toy and the audience is fooled into believing the battle's over, and then the toy doesn't work. But that's definitely not what happened here. In the end, Bandai had to save the Ultraman. But wow, Red King, you should be proud of yourself. It took you 52 years, but you finally took down an Ultraman. If Red King can take down two Ultra Heroes, then what happens if we pit two Red Kings against one Ultraman? Ultra Galaxy Fight New Generation Heroes did something unexpected with the monster, and brought back not only the same version of Red King we've seen countless times now, but alongside him, the director Koichi Sakamoto decided to bring back the second generation of Red King as well. You know, the one that swallowed the bomb that looked a little different? This was quite revolutionary, because it marked the first time an Ultra Monster in a main series show was remade to resemble a generation other than the original. It was also the second time two Red Kings appeared at once, with the first of course being Ultraman the Ultimate Hero. Despite all these milestones being achieved, the fight these two kings had together was quite brief, and Ultraman Reboot destroyed them soon after they emerged from a portal with his remote cutter attack. We'll get to see second gen Red King again though, so don't worry. Red King only showed up in Ultraman Taiga long enough to merge into Skolgamora again, so we'll skip that show and jump into Ultraman Z, which featured both Gen 1 and Gen 2 Red King again, and once more did something new with the kaiju. Something I'm personally not too happy with, but I'm sure a lot of you really like because it gave the monster some more development. You'll see what I mean in a minute. Two monsters means at least two suit actors, or in this case three. There's Hiroyuki Arai's name again, he sure has done a lot of Red King work. Koto Fukihara wrote both screenplays for the two main episodes that Red Kings were in. Let's check out the first of these. A Red King began rampaging around Fukuma City after being awakened by a blast at a quarry. You'd better say sorry, quarry. Look at how sad this boy is about what you've done. You ought to be ashamed. Why won't you apologize? Well, at least Ultraman Zet cares about this poor kid. I can't believe you quarry workers wouldn't stand up for him. Uh, the quarry workers aren't here, Professor. Uh, oh. Well, then they should be doubly ashamed. Anyway, to match Red King in strength, Zed arrived in his Beta Smash form. The two were pretty evenly matched, but the odds swung in favor of the good guys pretty quickly when Storage's King Joe Custom arrived on the screen. But it turns out Red King had a friend as well, his better half. The match was quickly back to being even. Zet used some toy power to put an end to his opponent and then hopped on over to assist King Joe Storage Custom in finishing off the other monster. But then, Zet caught sight of something that changed everything. A Red King egg in the cave the Red Kings had emerged from. He quickly realized that all the Red Kings wanted was to defend their child, and suddenly he didn't feel too great about what he'd been doing. In fact, he was so upset he didn't even seem intrigued by the fact that this egg has Red King scales on it? A scaly egg? Cool. I wonder what the best way to crack it is. Zet felt obliged to protect the adult Red King now, and defended it from King Joe's storage custom, allowing the creature to return to its nest, to raise another terror of humanity to replace the one that had just gotten taken down. Good work, Zet. It all ended up being pointless, however, because in the finale of the series, Ultroid Zero stopped by and defeated this rescued Red King anyway, leaving the scaly egg without anyone to care for it. What happened to it is unknown, which I feel is an unfortunate loose end. But aside from that, I just don't really like Red King being treated as a sympathetic monster in this series. It was definitely an unexpected twist, so Zet gets points for that, but I really feel like it deviates from the core of what Red King is. A really funny bully who shows no mercy and absolutely demolishes his opponents before ultimately getting what he deserves. He deserves no pity, and thus we get to laugh at him when he gets his hilarious comeuppance. Making him sympathetic means we can no longer enjoy his amusing attempts to rip his foes to shreds, because we just feel bad for him. Ultraman Blazar recently had another episode like this, which did basically the same story all over, but using a different kaiju species, and this worked far better in my opinion. Plus, Gamora is already a monster Subaraya wants us to have sympathy for. Why do we have to give Red King that role? Well, I guess probably because they had two suits they could utilize, but giving the part to Red King still rubs me the wrong way. That being said, I'm sure a lot of you disagree with me, and that's fine, just putting my opinion out there. I'm definitely not totally against the monster's treatment in the series. I think it's cool that we got to see a Red King nest. Okay, rant over. Let's move on to Ultraman Decker. 
You'll notice that for this show, Red King's default look was oddly his Gen 2 appearance. The reason for this is the Generation 1 Red King suit, which sources indicate is the same they've been using all the way back since Ultraman Max, got modified into Sphere Red King for Decker. Perhaps this old suit needed to be retired, so they changed it into something else. I don't know. Based on Ultraman Blazar, which we'll get to momentarily, it appears that the Gen 2 one has become the default. Oh, by the way, did anyone else notice that Sphere Red King is actually red? Woohoo! Hiroyuki Arai, who I guess is some kind of human Red King, considering how many times he's been hired to play the big guy, did the acting for both normal Red King and Sphere Red King in this show. Keeping with the tradition of using Red King a ton, the Decker series gave him two episodes. Let's look at them. One day, Red King just felt like showing up and causing trouble. So he did. He also brought back his little delighted hand movements and chucked a building at the Guts Falcon in a cool scene. Kanata decided to distract Red King with Wyndham, who showed up and shoved Red King on the ground, buying everyone maybe an extra seven seconds. Nice. Maybe a little more effort next time, Kanata. Suddenly, a man who was actually an alien of the Gregor species showed up to put an end to the madness. He did a lot of damage to the beast, but ended up needing some backup from Gut Select to seal the deal and chase Red King away. But the monster soon returned, more powerful than before, as Sphere Red King, after getting infected by the spheres that were threatening the Earth. Even though the Gregor was there, Decker decided to try and take down this menace on his own, so the alien could finish training against Gut Select. But Sphere Red King had a bunch of new moves up his sleeve, and Decker's kind act didn't work out, and the Gregor had to get involved. He held the monster still so Guts Select could take the menace out, and then Decker used Ultra 7's monsters to pull the giant wrestler man to safety. And that took care of Sphere Red King. Later, in episode 23, the powerful spheres made it so, somehow Sphere Red King returned, alongside Sphere Gamora. Boy, these two really have become buddies, haven't they? Sphere Neo Megas soon joined the party too. Even in his dynamic type, the three kaiju were able to wallop Decker, battering him around like a volleyball. In the end, he was somehow able to turn things around and take out Sphere Red King with a spinning attack. There's still a lot left to cover in this class, but we've reached the final major appearance for the monster. This one is so recent that, at the time I am writing the script for this video, it hasn't even occurred yet. So now, I would like to introduce a special guest, Future Me, to give you all the details on Red King's appearance in Ultraman Blazar. Take it away, me! Thank you, past me, and just a heads up, buddy, be ready for dozens of hours more work in the weeks ahead to complete this video. I haven't been keeping track of the amount of hours put in to make this class, but it's been a whole lot. So if you're enjoying the finished video, please like, subscribe, comment, and check out my other videos. Also, I can now officially say that at the end of this video, you will get to hear, for the very first time, my brand new Toku Professor theme song, which was composed to be like a theme for a Toku show. From now on, it will play at the end of my videos. I've also got some bloopers at the end for you all as well. With that out of the way, let's take a look at Ultraman Blazar Episode 22, Insurance Hero. Ultraman Blazar has been the first series in a very long time to feature a monster lineup consisting nearly entirely of newcomer kaiju. You've got new rising stars like Bazanga, Teganular, Gabaga, and then also Red King, one of the most used ultra kaiju of all. Baffling. My assumption is that the Blazar budget wasn't big enough for a new suit to be present in every episode, so Red King, being the jobber that he is, took the role. This episode was released extremely recently, so it makes sense that we don't know too much about the behind-the-scenes production process, but we do know that Junichiro Ashiki wrote the screenplay, and that yet again, Hiroyuki Arai wore the Red King suit. And speaking of the suit, as past me mentioned, it was the Gen 2 design, and this time around the Gen 1 suit was nowhere in sight. The Blazar series tries to cover up the Gen 2 suit's takeover by making episode 22 into a tribute to the old Mystery Comet Suifan episode. But I'm pretty certain that either the Gen 1 design suit was retired, or it's still lying around in a warehouse somewhere as Sphere Red King, and they haven't converted it back into the default monster yet. Guess we'll have to see if it's ever used again. Alright, let's jump into Red King's in-universe history one last time. According to a Scarred member, a Red King appeared sometime prior to this episode on Tatari Island, a place with a name suspiciously similar to Tatara Island. This world's second Red King was caught on tape bullying a Gigas into submission somewhere in the Japanese Alps. It seems Red King was trying to live up to his name by making himself king over the poor freezing monster. Once the bully had converted the white monster into his servant, the two made their way to Matsumoto City, perhaps to conquer a kingdom for King Red King to rule over. Both creatures attacked Scard's mech, Earth Garon, and eventually Ultraman Blazar leapt into the fight too, to protect several civilians. 
Blazar fought Red King, and Gigas fought Earth Garon, but the freezing monster was able to freeze Earth Garon solid and then assist Red King, freezing Blazar as well. Red King cracked his knuckles again, ready to wallop the Ultra, but Blazar's fire dragon monster, Ferdron, was able to help thaw the hero out, and then the Ultraman used his powered up Tilsonite sword as a Toreador's cape to lure Gigas into accidentally slamming into Red King. Serves you right for bullying, Gigas, you silly kaiju. Then, Blazar and the revived Earth Garon lined up to destroy all monsters, and the two kaiju hugged each other fearfully as the beam that would be their demise rushed toward them. You can't help but feel bad for the two watching this scene. It's amusing as well, though. And that covers it. That's Red King's history in Ultraman Blazar. Back to you, me from the past. Wow, future me. Not even I knew most of that. Anyway, with that, we have now finished the major appearances section of this video. On to the rankings! We've looked at so many Red King appearances today, and now it's time for me to answer the question, which three were the best, and which one was the worst? We'll save the best for last, and take a look at what I consider to be the bottom of the barrel to start. Please remember that everything you are about to hear is just my personal opinion, and you are free to like and dislike whichever Red Kings you want. You just can't dislike all of them. That would be a crime. For me, Red King's worst appearance was... Well, you know what? This is pretty hard. Subaraya Productions has been very consistent with their use of Red King through the decades, and though they definitely overuse him, the studio constantly does interesting stuff with their corn beast. I've narrowed it down to a few that I think are the weakest. Obviously, Ultraman the Ultimate Hero wasn't a great appearance for the monster, but for that show's standards, it wasn't that bad. Red King could barely do anything in Ultraman Ginga, but that was just because he was a live spark doll and he wasn't the one in control. Then there are forgettable performances, such as Ultra Zero Fight, Ultraman Ginga S Episode 1, Ultraman X, and even Ultraman Rube, though he did finally beat some Ultra Heroes in the latter. In the end, I decided to give the Worst Appearance Award to EX Red King in Ultraman Ginga S Episode 1, mainly just because it's forgettable and EX Red King didn't show much personality. He just punched a lot. Now, on a happier note, which three appearances were the best? Third place for me goes to Red King's first appearance in Ultra Galaxy Mega Monster Battle. This series treated its monsters so well, and Red King was no exception. Episode 1 had excellent Red King fights, making the monster look both brutal and comical. This may just be the best episode to show people to introduce them to the creature. Second place goes to Red King's very first appearance in the Lawless Monster Zone. How could I place the episode that started it all any lower? This performance by Red King is classic and memorable. It's no wonder they kept bringing him back after this. But I think I like his second appearance in the 1966 series even more. His appearance is a bit of a downgrade, but they cranked up the comedy, and it is just amazing. He also actually put up a fight against Ultraman this time around, so that's nice. I'd love to see a version of Red King II's fights that play out just the same, but with modern tokusatsu effects in his Gen 1 appearance. That would be legendary. Speaking of funny appearances, I have to give an honorable mention to Ultraman Max episode 36. That flying Red King leap might just be the monster's most hilarious moment. Now, let's check out some minor appearances. As was also the case with Zeton, Red King has made way too many minor appearances for me to cover all of them. So like I did with the Space Dinosaur, I'm going to just throw a list of all the ones I could find up on the screen and then look at a few highlights. Here's the list of minor appearances I compiled, presented in no particular order. Be sure to memorize them all, there will be a test. What? Whoa! Really? <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Before writing a comment saying I missed a Red King appearance, please check this list, because it may actually be included. That being said, if I did overlook anything, and there's a very high likelihood that I did, your comments are certainly welcome. Messages that fill in what I missed will go a long way towards making this the definitive, complete history of Red King. Also, considering how well-known Red King is, I'm very aware that it won't take long for this video to become outdated, so feel free to add comments that mention his post-2023 appearances as well. In fact, if you know anything at all about the monster that I didn't mention, type it in there. Let's check out some important minor appearances. Ultraman, the manga that inspired the Netflix anime, features a character named Red, who was certainly intended to bear a resemblance to the popular Ultra Kaiju. Red King was featured in several episodes of a project Subaraya Productions made in collaboration with the Singapore Tourism Board that featured the original Ultraman battling several monsters in famous Singapore areas. Ultrazone may technically be more of a major appearance for Red King, but I don't have any way to watch the show and it's not that well known, so we'll mention it here instead. In it, Red King apparently showed up multiple times. 
Ultraman Fighting Evolution Rebirth, a PlayStation 2 game, is where EX Red King originates from. A lot of other game-exclusive Red King forms never ended up escaping their debut titles, but EX Red King could not be contained. Mega Monster Rush Ultra Frontier featured the creature as a major monster for the Rush Hunters to take down. Grand King, from Ultraman Story, like Tyrant before him, was in-universe partially built from Red King. Lastly, to wrap this section up, a 2003 stage show apparently handed Red King a loss to Chandlar for the first time, with the winged creature at last taking the creature down by using his poisonous claws. And this is the perfect segue into our next topic for this class, Red King's many rivalries. If you beat other tough kaiju up as often as the King of Corn does, you're bound to make a lot of enemies, and with Red King, that is definitely the case. Every monster he fought directly in the original Ultraman show, excluding Magular, who doesn't count because he just burrowed away, returned alongside Red King in at least one other show. Chandlar got his rematch in Ultraman the Ultimate Hero. Pigmon confronted Red King again in Ultraman Max and Ultra Zero Fight. Duraco returned for round two in The Ultimate Hero, and Gigas came back alongside Red King in Blazar. But perhaps his greatest rival, at least these days, is Gamora. Remember back in the history of Gamora when I plopped this note on the screen? The one that said, if I ever do a history of Red King, I hope to get into the similarities this kaiju has with Gamora? Well, last time I checked, I'm doing a history of Red King, so maybe I should, you know, do that. Other than the final boss of the series, Red King and Gamora were arguably the most powerful and violent kaiju from the original Ultraman, and both were native to Earth and lived on islands. Red King literally ripped other monsters apart, while Gamora was able to basically beat Ultraman. Both also appeared in episodes written by Tetsuo Kinjo, and were upright, underground-dwelling dinosaur-like creatures with totally new costumes that proved to be quite popular. They almost got to battle each other in The Little Hero, and finally got to in Ultra Galaxy Mega Monster Battle. Gamora was the protagonist monster of the show for the first time ever, and Red King was his first opponent, legendary timing for their first fight. Prior to the Ultra Galaxy era, the creatures had both been in the same episode of Ultraman Mabius, and the New Generation era put them alongside each other frequently, and even merged them into Skull Gamora in Jeed. No offense to Aberus and Benira, but this may just be the greatest monster rivalry in the Ultraman series. <laughs> Now it's time to check out Red King merch! The creature is definitely one of the top 10 most popular Ultraman monsters, and since Subarai Productions is partially owned by a toy company, you'd better believe there's a lot of Red King merchandise out there. As well as right here! Here's all the Red King stuff I own from my Toku Archive, aka my personal collection. I've got Ultra Monster series figures, both the older variety and most of the Spark Doll sized ones, this Sound Battler powered Red King, and this posable Shoto Red King. Happy to have them all. And these are just the ones I personally own. I've got more in my eBay store, along with hundreds of other Ultraman toys. If you're interested, be sure to check them out. Guess what, students? I'm giving this EX Red King figure away for free. Just follow the on-screen instructions and you could win him. Don't you want him? He's so good. There's also way more Red King stuff I've never gotten my hands on out there. Frankly, there's probably enough to cover a wall. Cards, keychains, Bullmark figures, Ultra Act, Mezco, way more Bandai, stuff most collectors probably don't even know exist. There's a lot. I also own one other item I'd like to show you. This is Mill Creek's Ultraman Battle Kaiju Series 1 Blu-ray set, titled Ultraman vs. Red King. This collection features nearly every major appearance of the monster we looked at today, all in one collection. Definitely an excellent addition to a Red King collection. Oh, and this isn't sponsored by Mill Creek, by the way. Just decided to bring it up. And with that, I think we've done it. We have covered the complete history of Red King. I sure hope this class has been informative, students. For your homework, all you have to do is like, subscribe, comment, and for extra credit, you can check out my eBay store and Twitter account. I hope you'll take everything you learned today to heart out in this dangerous toku world. And that wraps it up. Class dismissed. You. Hmm? Uh, oh. Animaniac. Sorry to rayonic burst your Connie bubbler, kitty cat, but everything we just learned about was a lie. Wait, what? No, it wasn't. Oh, of course it was. The professor just wanted to make tokusatsu look good by describing this powerful, funny monster that's so entertaining, as if watching some guy in a rubber suit could ever be entertaining. Hey! But no, when it comes to pop culture, anime's the only genre that can give you such great moments. None of this stuff ever aired on TV. And these here notes... Hey, give it back! ...are worthless. That's not true! Uh, oh, wait. Well, I guess that is kind of true on a technicality since you're holding them. <laughs>
Good call. There you go. Oh, by the way, don't know if anyone told you, but a certain little yours truly is currently lined up to be your opponent for boxing club tomorrow. Oh, no! I mean, oh. I'm trying to get everybody to drop out of this stupid class. If you agree to join my movement, maybe I'll agree to call it off and spare you some pain. In the meantime, I'll be holding on to your precious stationary pencil leopard. Keep it safe, you know? You can't scare me, you, you scary... I, I mean... <laughs> Heh, see you tomorrow, weakling. Uh, uh. Huh, it's funny that he bullies people like Red King, even though he doesn't think his history is real. I can't wait to watch you beat that kid up tomorrow. But he took my notes. I can't train to fight as well as Red King without them. Oh, well, here, you can use mine. I don't need them. <gasps> Thank you, Kashimukun. Well, what are you waiting for? Get out there and stand up for Tokusatsu. I have the leopard. I I'll do it. I'll learn to fight the way Red King would. Go get him, Pencil Neck. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, wait, I guess for me that's a compliment. W whatever. Time to make this a lawless leopard zone. So you arrived. Well, what'll it be, Kitty? Joining Team Anime, or do we fight? I only have one thing to say. Let's spar! What's with all this confidence? <clears throat> uh, you'll regret it. <laughs> but fine, have it your way. Whew, here we go. Wait a minute, wait a minute, what, what was that? A uh, cheater, he cheat, did you see, he? Ugh. Yes, I, I did it, I did it, a oh, winner is me, I, I must be invincible, I, I think I am. Um, well let's not get ahead of our skis. But, but, but I am, I'm an unstoppable force, I can take down any opponent, I- <laughs> Who's that? Uh, ah! <laughs> 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 Sorry, Pencil Leopard, but I just had to try fighting out. How did you do that? You didn't even have the notes. I don't know. With skill. You're creepy. All right, calm down, everyone. Let's celebrate your victories with a celebratory feast. What's on the menu? Ah. <laughs> Red King was given a project and finished transforming one of Hikaru Raidu in the same suit from the kaiju with the enormous arms was too powerful for the white creature and showed nerm this violent version of the monster bird so we'll skip that show and jump into Ultraman Z which featured whoa for your homework okay 